Okay, plasma cell and neoplasms or dyscrasias, but I can't spell dyscrasias, so we're going to go with neoplasms. Two things that apply to all these are increased serum protein with normal albumin or a protein gap, uh, which would suggest that you have some protein other than albumin, which would be an antibody in this case that is increasing the serum protein level. Uh, and then elevated monoclonal protein on your serum protein electrophoresis. And then just a quick overview of the different syndromes we're going to talk about with your monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance. These people have a chance of turning into multiple myeloma and ultimately they were evaluated for multiple myeloma but were negative but still had a positive SPEP for M-protein and increased serum protein but they didn't have all the classic multiple myeloma findings and those would include anemia, increased calcium, renal insufficiency, and lytic bone lesions or chronic bone pain. And then another random thing we're going to talk about is Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia, uh, which is likely to show up at least for one question on the test, and you'll probably have to diagnose it. It's due to IgM production, which is different from the IgG in multiple myeloma, which causes symptoms of increased serum viscosity, and it also has the characteristic peripheral neuropathy, which is going to be different than the other two. So let's just run through MGUS really fast here. <clears throat> so somebody gets worked up for multiple myeloma for whatever reason. They have a vasculitis, hypercalcemia, um, and multiple myeloma is common enough that many people are going to get worked up for it with an SPEP or a light chain serum assay by their PCP or other provider. And if they come back negative uh, and there's no evidence of renal insufficiency or lytic bone lesions or an increased calcium level, um, then you're going to be more inclined to think it's an MGUS syndrome. But if you still aren't convinced, you could do a bone marrow biopsy. And if there's less than 10% plasma cells, that would confirm that this is an MGUS, not multiple myeloma. But these people have a 1% chance uh, of turning into multiple myeloma. So be aware of that. They are, it's, it's considered to be a precursor in some ways. I, I don't know if that's universally considered to be true, so don't hold me to that. So uh, with these patients, uh, let's say they told you they've ordered a bunch of stuff. What's one thing that anybody with suspected MGUS but not confirmed MGUS should have as part of their workup? So don't forget that they should have a skeletal assay with x-rays of all their long bones to make sure that there aren't any lytic bone lesions that might lead you to think this is actually a multiple myeloma. So now we're going to talk about multiple myeloma, and I want to start by going over a few of the different presentations because very rarely are you going to have the classic five symptoms of multiple myeloma right in front of you. They're going to go vague, 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 and they're going to make it really challenging for you to notice multiple myeloma, so you need to go into vague questions with a high index of suspicion for multiple myeloma. So let's start with one here. You've got an old guy with chronic severe back pain, even some chest pain, and he has a fever. And you find some anemia, it's a normocytic anemia, and increased calcium. That's a bunch of information right there, and if they give you that much information, you could expect that they're probably going to expect you to uh, tell them how to screen for it or how to diagnose it, but they're not just going to say, oh, is this multiple myeloma? Because they've, they've given you a lot right there. Then you could have somebody who has had chronic low back pain, and now he's got new uh, loss of sensation in the perineum with progression of his back pain, and it's super severe, so it's called a Aquinas syndrome. And then the MRI shows that there's a mass compression of the spinal cord, and then you do a biopsy after you do surgery, or not a biopsy, you get the pathology from surgery, and it's a, a plasma cell. And this is a uh, uh, this is multiple myeloma giving you a, a mass of plasma cells, and I have the name of that in the next slide, and I forgot it right here. Uh, and again, those are both pretty obvious if you get those, but they'd love to try and give you the, the Cauda Aquinas syndrome uh, and have you just assume that it's due to another cause and not have you think about multiple myeloma, maybe put other answer choices that assume that you didn't finish reading the question. Uh, and someone who just has a fever and hypercalcemia, uh, if they're old, that's good enough for me. 
that I'd want to screen them on the shelf with an SPEP or a serum free light chain assay for multiple myeloma. And then another common presentation in real life as well, not just on the shelf, is that people present with acute renal failure or insufficiency with increased creatinine and calcium. But the characteristic finding in multiple myeloma is that they have a normal urinalysis with a negative protein dipstick. So go over some of the uh, picadillos here. Uh, we've got this, it likes to go to the bone marrow, causes the bone pain, lytic bone lesions on x-ray. Uh, you may have a picture of a lytic bone lesion on your shelf. That would be a slam dunk if you're given that. And IgG antibodies here, make sure you're aware of that. And we talked about the protein gap already in the serum. And know that the acute renal damage is due to light chain filtration, but also due to the hypercalcemia in addition. And as we're going to talk about in a minute, they're at risk for acute renal injury from the light chain filtration, but also for chronic renal disease secondary to this chronic uh, filtration of all these antibodies causing amyloidosis. And the anemia, you should remember, is normocytic and fatigue, weight loss, all those classic symptoms, and hypercalcemia. They, this is, I mean, this is the one thing that might be on every question is someone's going to have a calcium greater than 10.5 or 11 mg per deciliter. That's going to be just something anybody who you're on the fence about, maybe they have uh, m and or not, that's going to be, for me, when I see hypercalcemia and somebody with a fever and any kind of bone pain or anything, it, slam dunk multiple myeloma and then that's what i forgot with the cauda equina syndrome plasma cytoma so these can form masses of plasma cells and they can be pretty devastating symptom wise and this is an obvious way people could present and i think it's not obvious for you to think that on your shelf they might pull this on you but they'd love to do that to you and know that they could also happen to have a plasma cytoma in their brain causing a headache or signs of increased icp so how do we diagnose multiple myeloma this is something that you may be asked to do when you have one of the more obvious presentations. And you screen for multiple myeloma with not just the SPEP, but you could also do a serum free light chain assay. So make sure you are aware of that. Because they may not give you SPEP as one of the options. And if you did do an SPEP, you get the monoclonal protein peak, the M protein spike, we know that. Um, and let's say you have a positive screen now we can do a bone marrow biopsy, and unlike MGUS, where there's less than 10% in multiple myeloma, we have greater than 10% plasma cells in the bone marrow. And anybody who has tested positive for all of these things here should go through a 24-hour urine protein electrophoresis to see if there is loss of light chain in the urine contributing to proteinuria. Because as we've already talked about, the urinalysis will not reveal proteinuria if it's just the light chain going through. And all these patients also need to have a full scalable survey of their long bones to sort of almost stage their myeloma and see how severe it is, how many bones are involved, and how diffusely involved their uh, skeleton is. And so how do we evaluate the renal dysfunction? So uh, they can come in with a creatinine of greater than two and, and they're gonna give you that curveball of just normal UA and negative dipstick and you're just like, well, they're fine. What, what the heck's wrong with their kidney? And what you can, I'm not sure how they would test you on this, but in general, if you do, let's say you suspect somebody has multiple myeloma based on this finding on the urinalysis, which is no finding, uh, you could order a serum free light chain assay and in the setting of a creatinine elevation, that would be enough to diagnose myeloma kidney. But if you wanted a more confirmative diagnosis, you could do the 24-hour urine protein electrophoresis. So let's say you had a multiple myeloma patient. Maybe they've had multiple myeloma for several years, and they've got symptoms of nephrotic syndrome like edema, ascites, low serum protein, and you do a dipstick, and it's got lots of protein, which is not what you would expect with m, &M. So this is actually nephrotic syndrome due to AL amyloidosis or light chain deposition disease uh, causing chronic loss of the membrane, the filtration barrier there, allowing albumin to escape in the urine. So there's two different causes of renal dysfunction in multiple myeloma patients. Do not forget that. One that comes on acutely with the disease, and this is more of a long-term complication with the disease than nephrotic syndrome. 
Yeah, we've gone through that. So I, I already talked about all this. Uh, Vince Jones proteinuria, that's what we call the light chain, light chain excretion in the urine. Just know that, just in case. Um, and everything else there, I've covered it for you. And I, I put a slide in here about AL amyloidosis, but just remember that you can get uh, nephrotic syndrome from AL amyloidosis, not just because of multiple myeloma. It could be related to any chronic uh, inflammatory condition with antibody production like lupus. Um, so, and again, the key here would be increased protein on that dipstick. Uh, and you'd have to biopsy peripheral tissue to confirm it. Uh, and the presentation of this is likely also going to include somebody having maybe constrictive uh, heart disease from amyloid infiltration as well. So the last thing we'll talk about is Waldenstrom's and if they give you enough information this is easy to separate from multiple myeloma but if you think about the presentation of a plasma cytoma causing cauda equina syndrome then it can be a little bit more difficult so hopefully they won't make it too uh, tricky for you but in general this is again plasma cell disorder infiltrates the bone marrow likes to cause thrombocytopenia and a more severe anemia than your multiple myeloma because this is actually a more aggressive proliferation and the key here is that they have increased IgM rather than IgG and that's going to cause hyperviscosity symptoms like dizziness and the classic exam finding on the exam is going to be dilated retinal veins that should be on your 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 shelf and if that's there with someone who has a positive SPEP in the question bingo it's Waldenstrom's that's going to be your answer um, and peripheral neuropathy is is really the hallmark of this disease and this is partly why somebody who has uh, maybe like a mononeuritis multiplex or someone who you think might have a a, uh, you know, like a vasculitis causing neuropathy, you order an SPEP to rule out myeloma, but also to rule out Waldenstrom's because it causes the peripheral neuropathy. Uh, and these people lack uh, the characteristic features of multiple myeloma, like the bone lesions, the hypercalcemia, and they have normal renal function. So uh, if they give you enough information, like I said, this is very easy to separate from multiple myeloma. The problem is, you know, if they give you just that they have fatigue and anemia, and thrombocytopenia, and you know maybe some dizziness. You know then it's not too easy to tell. But I think that you could be expected to diagnose this on your shelf, and that's probably where it ends for this disorder.